I'm honored to be given the opportunity of chairing this plenary section. Um, the, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Li Dan, who I'm sure uh, all, of you, uh, all of us know very well for his outstanding contribution to deep learning and to uh, automatic speech recognition. And he has just been bestowed by the IEEE uh, Signal Processing Society with the Teleco Achievement Award. Uh, Dr. Dan is affiliated with Microsoft Research, and prior to joining Microsoft, he was a faculty member at the University of Waterloo. Uh, Dr. Dan's uh, current research interests are centered on business critical applications involving big data analytics, natural language processing, semantic modeling, speech, image, and multimodal signals. The title of his plenary talk is Deep Learning for Artificial Intelligence. Um, uh, from uh, machine uh, perception to machine cognition. Uh, without further ado, please join me to welcome Dr. Dan. So thank you very much. Uh, Professor Ching, and I would like to thank uh, the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to share some of my thoughts together with many of my colleagues about this topic of both AI and deep learning. Um, so I currently uh, have been working uh, partly split, splitting my time um, at Microsoft Research, and also I'm spending uh, 50 50% time working with the business uh, group. It's called the Application Service Group. This is the largest uh, business group at Microsoft. Um, I would like to thank many of my colleagues and collaborators, including people from university, as well as uh, my own company and other companies as well, uh, for preparing this set of slides. Uh, actually, some of the slides actually have come from my colleagues that I asked to uh, contribute. Um, I share, uh, would like to share, you know, uh, my views as well as others in terms of industry-wide uh, effort in AI and deep learning. So just to explain what this is, uh, I actually copy um, part of the information here from Wikipedia. By the way, Wikipedia on this page is very, has very, very detailed information. So those are a few definitions that characterize deep learning in a fairly succinct manner. Um, so the point of, the main point of deep learning is that it actually exploits multiple layers recursive or cascade of nonlinear processing. Uh, and also it advocates uh, a way of doing system design, namely end-to-end -end optimization rather than modular design and handcrafted features. And finally, the last part of the definition, I think, is very well done in terms of different levels of abstraction in, in a hierarchy. And that specifically applies for many of these concepts uh, in AI type of uh, construction for, uh, for the representation of natural language as well as the business data for, for many, many other type of uh, entities in the world. Uh, and notice that in this definition, you don't see any neural network, right? So neural network is one way of uh, implementing these many layers of nonlinear processing, but not the only way. So I'm going to show you some other ways of doing deep learning, which complement with many of uh, the neural net you know, method that many of you have been aware of. And again, you go to Wikipedia, you can find AI as well. And the definition is not nearly as nice as the one in uh, deep learning uh, website. Uh, so Wikipedia side. So they use a lot of recursive, you know, sort of, uh, sort of senseless uh, definition. Uh, talking about artificial intelligence is intelligence by something. I mean, it's just a recursive definition. And there's another very important concept called the uh, AGI, general, kind of artificial general uh, intelligence and definition in Wikipedia is even worse. They essentially just say, that, well, this is artificial intelligence that's general. It doesn't really take much. So for the next slide, I actually want to give fairly precise definition as to how deep learning and AI and AGI are connected to each other. And that's the one that formed the main thesis of this presentation. So I define AI or general uh, 
artificial intelligence in terms of two parts. The first part is what I call uh, machine perception. That includes sort of per, you know, human way of perceiving the world, such as vision, speech, image, video, gesture, touch, you know, all things related to human kind of perception. So for today, I'm going to only talk about speech and image in this part. And the second part of AI that I consider to be more important, and as far as most of the AI you know, experts uh, criticize deep learning, saying that you guys only do speech and image in a video. You don't really solve the real problem of AI. And I do uh, want to emphasize that now deep learning is entering very quickly into this area, including something that's not directly perceived by human, but in terms of what happened after the perception is done. Then you actually do other further type of processing, including reasoning, common, you know, uh, common sense reasoning, uh, attention, memory, and the learning, they are very closely related to each other. And many of those cognitive functions are reflected in natural language, as well as, well as other type of uh, data information. Um, a very important part of this uh, cognition is the knowledge management and exploitation. How do you actually you know, get all the knowledge in the world in such a way that will facilitate your cognitive process? And human uh, beings are doing that you know, very, very nicely. And another part uh, which I'm going to emphasize a lot is decision making. How do you make optimal decisions in face of uncertainty, in face of you know, the whole environment uh, uh, environmental factors. Um, and that is the part I'm going to spend a fair amount of time uh, talking about. In light of this uh, recent AlphaGo, you may have uh, already seen a lot of news about this. Um, so the main thesis of this, uh, of this presentation is that when you combine a special type of learning uh, method called the reinforced learning, together with the deep learning in terms of the earlier uh, definition that I just showed you, it actually will provide a path towards uh, AI and AGI. And AGI is defined to be general adaptive and flexible artificial intelligence where the learning actually occurs using first principle rather than using all the human crafted uh, sort of skills. Now to talk about uh, this uh, reinforced learning, I would like to uh, just to place this um, reinforced learning and also AlphaGo, the kind of uh, recent uh, sort of uh, AI milestone in terms of this uh, division of AI, it really belongs to decision making component of uh, cognition rather than perception. And I'm going to spend more time talking about this in some more detail in connection with many of these techniques that this community have been uh, familiar with, like A star search, like, you know, the tree search, a whole bunch of other things, and neural network as well. So perhaps at the end of this hour, you'll probably understand this recent uh, achievement better than otherwise. So this is the outline of this presentation. So I will spend maybe the first one, one quarter or maybe one half, uh, of one third of time talking about perception and, and specifically talk about speech and image. And then I will go through uh, five or six uh, areas of machine cognition tasks and showing you some of the, you know, sort of very interesting progress over the last, just, just, you know, most of the progress was actually just done within the last two years. And the momentum is building up in doing all this. And finally, I will share my own view together with, you know, discussion with uh, many of colleagues about three hot areas of deep learning AI research. So first of all, before I get to uh, perception, speech, and image, I just want to draw your attention about uh, this conference called the NIPS, Neural Information Processing, is a very uh, interesting conference. And how I have been with this conference for the last 12 years or something, almost every single year I went there. So this conference, just last year, about four months ago, it went through just a huge uh, search. Uh, so basically the conference has three parts, tutorial part, and com main conference part, and the workshop part. And the, um, in the, this, this are the number of uh, attendees, basically double last year compared with the year before. And one of the reasons why it's double is because there's a uh, deep learning tutorial given by, you know, all, uh, by some very well-known people, pioneer in this area. Now, I want to draw your special attention about this part. Uh, so actually, workshop is a lot of action. It's where a lot of action takes place. 
So give you an example, uh, Elon Musk, you probably know a lot, a lot about his view of our AI. Right? He actually sort of uh, funded this company about $1 billion called OpenAI. So the very last day of a workshop, they actually make the announcement, then everybody gets excited, and then right after the banquet, uh, the last day, you know, he actually opened, they actually opened up this, uh, what's called the reception. So most of the people, about a few thousand people, you know, in, in, in this conference room, you know, just, it's just flat immediately go to the next building, you know, for their, uh, for their, uh, for their reception. Uh, that was a very, uh, sort of, you know, a lot of Twitter, it's a really fast information. When they do uh, read that and everybody flop over there. So I got the chance to see a lot of people over there. Uh, and also the last speaker of the NIPS workshop. Once uh, he finished uh, you know, his talk, he just flipped the sign from Google Brain to OpenAI. <laughs> anyway, so this is a lot of things going on. That's what happened uh, last, uh, uh, just uh, previous year, just about four months ago. And in the early years, I chose some specific uh, you know, uh, years. So this year, is uh, Mark Zuckerberg actually literally went there to organize, uh, to actually speak uh, in a forum. That was made, decision was made just the very last minute. It kicked up all the other, uh, you know, uh, presentation, and many people are not happy about this. Um, and then the year before, 2012, that's also a very big event, a lot of big event happening. Uh, I'm Jeff Hinton gave a very nice talk about, that was the first time that image net uh, was comprehensively described uh, to, you know, machine learning people uh, beyond the computer vision people. And people, and there are some, some very interesting uh, Q&A going on. At that time, 2002, that's only uh, three and a half years ago, uh, people have all the doubt. I mean, there's a very famous person in the audience uh, during uh, that workshop after Jeff Hinton talked about uh, ImageNet with the uh, dropout method that many people here will know. He actually, well, he's actually the next president of AI, uh, uh, AI society, you know, Tom Dietrich. I mean, he's very personal. He actually raised the hand. He said, are you sure that your program don't have any bug. <laughs> Talking about, you know, cutting, you know, kill neurons randomly and get a huge improvement in image net. And there was a lot of discussion going on. That was very impressive. Uh, I've actually, I learned a lot over there. And also about a couple, uh, a few more years earlier, uh, so uh, Professor Jeff Hinton and Microsoft Research, actually, we actually worked together. So this is how I want to start with this uh, uh, NIPS workshop. So about, that's about five and a half years ago. So we actually organized Microsoft, uh, my colleagues, uh, as well as with Academia. At that time, he was still at uh, University of Washington, uh, no, sorry, University of Toronto, uh, uh, organizing this workshop about deep learning for speech recognition. And then, after about two years of very intense work, uh, this, uh, we actually, um, actually got this uh, really, really strong results and uh, John Markov uh, from New York Times actually came to Microsoft Research and interviewed with me uh, and all with, uh, uh, with a whole bunch of other people at Microsoft. And this, he's uh, Rick Rashid. Uh, he's actually the boss of many of us Microsoft people sitting here, down here. And I was actually, uh, uh, he was my boss at, at, at the same time, uh, at that time. And that probably is the very first large scale public uh, sort of so announcement that deep learning uh, a program are really successful based upon Microsoft um, public demo by Rick Rush in Tianjin, not very far from here, uh, for the uh, speech to speech translation powered by deep learning. And uh, this is Jeff Hinton and he's also featured over here. Um, so we actually uh, told our, the reporter that uh, this is the result of close collaboration between academic and university. Uh, the academic in our uh, company. And I'm going to be very short here. So, so, so the path that led to that you know, public uh, demo to show the success of uh, deep learning actually came from you know, intense work, uh, mostly within Microsoft at that time in early days. And then, and pretty, yeah, these, I think these are the earliest papers uh, you know, many of those are in ICASP and Interspeech mostly, and some of them are NIPS, um, related to how deep learning actually power uh, speech recognition. And this is the architecture that developed, was developed. Uh, it's called the uh, context-dependent uh, deep neural network, Hidden Markov, you know, it's a hybrid system that was invented in 2010. 
uh, and this is the, um, the, the, the progress for spontaneous speech recognition in terms of word, word error rate, the lower the better. You notice that in around 1993, when this uh, sort of uh, challenge was first started, uh, and DARPA uh, sponsored this, uh, this entire uh, sort of research until somewhere around, around here. Um, the error rate is almost 100%. For those of you who don't know speech recognition, very often error rate could be more than 100% because every time you insert word or, or you delete word, you count the error. So if your system isn't good, you get about 130% error. That happens all the time. And that's what happened in the early days. Now, using the shallow learning uh, hidden Marco model with the states dependent upon Gaussian mixture model, which is this is shallow model, the error rate drops very fast over the first year, few years until about 2019, okay? Um, and then um, the project began, it pretty much reached the capacity of this shallow machine learning methods. Um, and then about 10 years, uh, there's very little progress made for this uh, spontaneous speech recognition until about 2010, 11, around the time, the tremendous amount of progress was made because of the use of deep learning, deep neural network, in connection with the uh, Hidemacher model. But now, I think within maybe two or three years, uh, this may be, will may, may be totally gone. Everything will be deep learning. And you have seen many papers here in this conference. Um, and, then, um, and then, you know, after an another uh, one or two years of work, and the error rate uh, continues to drop, and that led to uh, Rick Rush's uh, uh, demo. So, uh, so a lot of uh, some early work that I put in here, uh, you know, they are really just uh, you know, a collaboration with Toronto and Microsoft, and also I think they um, and Google uh, and, and IBM, and also I noticed that um, I think for some reason uh, somebody mailed that to me, indicating that uh, iFly Tech actually started somewhere as early as 2011. So that's very very early. So uh, I think 2013, I invited. Our Joshua Benjo to come to Microsoft for, for a faculty summit. And he actually take a look at this uh, progress and he did some really nice thing, artistic things. That the same information becomes something like this, okay? So two things uh, he did, it's exactly the same information. So one piece of information he did is that he made this uh, error rate from linear scale to be log scale, okay? <laughs> And number two, he did something, uh, something very nice. I'm smooth the curve. Okay? So you now probably heard many, you know, uh, you know, superstars. Uh, these superstars uh, at, 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 at their presentation, they keep saying that uh, deep learning uh, sort of achieved just within you know one or two years achieved more progress than about 20, 30 years of progress. And looking at this curve, it is true. Right? This is just as much as this. Right? But if you look at the earlier, it doesn't seem to be that way. But anyway, so that's the magic of log scale. Uh, but anyway, and, uh, so, uh, so he's pretty diplomatic. I mean, this is actually a slide I took from their tutorial just about four months ago. It's about th almost 3,000 people attending that, that, that tutorial. And he put this one, right, of course, source come back, and he's very honest to put that according to Microsoft. That's correct, right? So nothing is wrong here. Um, and then he also put here, this one goes to Android, so he make everybody happy. Anyway, so within just about one or two years after the, uh, the speech, deep learning speech demo, you, can, you saw that you know, Baidu, uh, 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 so iFly Tech, all these companies have started using uh, uh, deep learning system into their commercial products, uh, including all the Microsoft product of the uh, Windows phones, uh, Xbox, and Skype. Um, so, uh, and also within one year, uh, the Skype officially became a product that everybody can use. So in the academic world, and people don't submit to attribute anymore, uh, so people just start uh, directly go to nature. I'm going to show a whole bunch of nature science papers related to this field. Uh, but in any, good, in any case, our single processing magazine still is well known. It's actually quoted by this survey paper that this is the, uh, our, that's coming from our society is the first uh, major speech recognition laboratories that details the first major applications of deep learning. That's very good. And those people, uh, a very large number of people, as many of those are sitting over here. And some of the uh, information in this paper have been outdated, so I don't have time to go through all this. Maybe 70% maybe are still valid up, up now. 
So I'm going to uh, fast forward from about three years ago, the one I just showed you, or maybe two, two and a half years ago until now. So what is the state of the art of speech recognition today? So for, to prepare for this uh, presentation, I actually asked uh, several industrial leaders to provide me with one slide out of their company to show their best architecture and best you know, way of thinking about speech recognition today. So that's what I got. So I'm going to do one, I, I want to thank uh, many of you who, uh, uh, who provide this slide for me. So I give all the full credit down here. So I, uh, Google, uh, Andrew, and Senior, and Tara provided me with this. Um, so you can see that compared to about two and a half years ago where deep neural network and hybrid system took stage in most of cases. Here today, you see that you have something like uh, LSTM. If you don't know what's going on, I will spell out to you. You don't, you may not, if you're not in space, you may not know what's going on. It's called long, short-term memory, okay? So it's not long, short, it's actually a short-term memory model, not long-term memory. It's just using the sort of uh, little trick to make short-term artificially to be long, and that's why it's not very good. So at the end of this talk, I'm actually going to brainstorm some of the much better ways of memory, the real memory related to, to how human uh, memory works. So LSTM is a very big one. And that actually can be considered to be extension of deep neural network with some weak memory embedded in the system. Therefore, it can memorize part of the speech signal. And another big thing is a, a CTC, standing for connectionless temporal classification. You say, what the heck is it? So essentially, that's a, to me, is actually a new way of defining objective function that is truly in the spirit of end-to-end. -end. You want to uh, optimize the what error rate without regard to any segmentation or everything else. Um, and, and the magic of CTC is that it invented this kind of very funny magic label called blank and put in some constraint in terms of the, you know, in terms of segmentation, in terms of repeated pattern, and then once you take into account these two magic, you can consider to be sort of hidden mark model. When you look at the, um, the uh, learning algorithm, it has a forward, backward, very much like hidden mark model. But anyway, so if you are in speech, you probably don't need to hear all this. It's so simple for you. But if you don't, you are not in the speech, you, you are not going, I don't think you, you probably won't know what I'm talking about anyway. So let me go, let me move forward. <laughs> Okay, so this is uh, Baidu's uh, slide. Uh, I think uh, Andrew Ng and Adam uh, Cook sent that to me and with some discussions. And they also use this CTC. So I think CTC is in. I'm not going to, I'm, 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 I'm 100 percent sure it's going to stay at least for a few more years until some better memory model, better ways of human cognition system will come to beat all this. Uh, and the nice thing about this is that for Chinese, it, this is really good for Chinese recognition because so each Chinese word, a uh, character, really just became an optical unit, and the neuron that can be big enough to accommodate that very easily. So that's, uh, and then you can look, when you look at the architecture, it's very much like DNA, and with the standard recurrent neuron. They don't actually use uh, else here, and they got, uh, they got a very good result. And this is uh, Apple's result. I think Alan Asaro providing the slide for me. Uh, this is more, you know, along the same kind of DNA structure except there is some additional change in probability predicted from DNA, and that also, sh uh, and that shows some improvement to the recognition accuracy, which didn't happen for hidden Markov model. So this is the iFly tech uh, number, and they also have very nice architecture here. So this is the IBM number from uh, George Sion and uh, Brian Kingsbury. Uh, they show some interesting sort of combination of convolutional net and LSTM, recurrent, uh, recurrent um, uh, neural net, that's LSTM, together with higher level of um, fully connected network and put them into bottleneck and then doing the recognition. And that actually gives them uh, sort of switchboard uh, accuracy down to 8%. So this is our Microsoft slide, I think, Sheldon Huang providing that to me. And we, uh, Microsoft actually put a lot of emphasis on this building systems infrastructure in addition to improving algorithms. And that's called the uh, Project uh, Oxford Service with the Speech API. Uh, a lot of research you heard uh, t uh, this week uh, from Microsoft actually uh, go, uh, actually uh, go, oh, went. Some of them went there, some of them is going to go there. 
Um, and also our Microsoft, yeah, actually, sorry, yeah, since I'm coming from Microsoft, I want to uh, show two slides rather than one. Uh, so this is so CNTK. I know many of you actually use that. Uh, it's really damn fast. Um, and you can see some of the comparisons. So again, you are even speech, you probably know all these results. And there are some additional things that uh, we haven't uh, been able to make um, comparison, uh, you know, recently. So this is pretty old uh, comparison. That was about three months ago. That's very old. Okay, and then some research papers here uh, are shown here. So I'm going to stop all the speech and going directly to image recognition. Um, so this is the image, image net competition. I heard some of the presentation yesterday about this as the inspiration for speech recognition. So I'm, I may just, you know, go start from the beginning. Um, so you are going to see that, um, um, so the progress is very, very much like speech recognition. And as, I think just by coincidence, the rec error rate, you know, number and switchboard number are just about the same, right? So for the shell load net, uh, for the shallow network based upon uh, sparse coding, based on SIFT features, for those of you who know about computer vision, and they actually got some about uh, 25, 26%. It, it's just like a speech recognition rate before deep learning, uh, very similar. Um, and then just one single year, 2012, the error rate dropped from uh, 26 to 15%, and many people didn't really quite believe. So at that time, when the result was first announced, so well, I was at Microsoft giving a lecture for deep learning, blah, 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 and then Jeff Hinton sent an email to me saying, look at this result. So I sent that to many of our computer vision experts in our, in our company. And they said, oh, that can't be true. I mean, it must be something wrong. Uh, and, then, and then it turned out that you know, people just repeated, you know, everything goes wrong. And especially the second year, the error rate dropped down from 15% uh, uh, down to 11%. And that's clarified this company actually it was formed based upon this model. Uh, we heard some presentation yesterday on Clarify. And then the third year into this deep learning, uh, the error rate dropped down to, uh, to even further, about 6%. And the human is about 5%. And then the fifth year, the final year, that just announced about, uh, four, about four months ago at NIPS, the error rate. Uh, so Microsoft was catch, in the catching up mode. We actually uh, got, you know, my colleagues, uh, Microsoft Research Asia, uh, they actually got the error down about 3.5, and then about the same as Google. It's slightly better. And then there's a little uh, news coming up. So sorry. So this is in China. So Tencent, if you are here, forgive me to, to show you this uh, diagram. Uh, and the key of that method is called residual network. Um, actually, it has some very intuitive uh, notion. And the reason why they drop errors so much is because they are able to build huge, hugely deep network. And normally, by conventional wisdom, you know, when the network becomes very large, the gradient, you know, vanishes quickly. And uh, it turned out that, uh, you know, when you build something like this, you have to, you know, so this is a Google's uh, uh, two years ago system. They built about 22 years. And the way they do that is that in order to avoid gradient diminishing, you actually have to put supervision signal every now and then, you know, don't make that all the way down there. And that's very interesting. Uh, it actually inspires us to think about how to avoid um, the gradient uh, uh, vanishing. So this is uh, the work done by, uh, by Mac, uh, Microsoft researchers uh, Jian Shen and his team. Um, so think about this uh, Alex network, okay? So there's eight networks here. And then uh, that, that's uh, Oxford and Google's network similar to this size, about 29. And then Microsoft uh, network goes about 150 something. If you really want to know how deep it is, this is the way. <laughs> that's it, okay? Uh, and there are some tricks. I mean, if you read the paper, you know how to, and the trick is very, very simple. Um, but anyway, so, so I finished uh, machine uh, perception. I'll show you uh, a whole bunch of applications in uh, machine cognition, which is most of my research, uh, you know, my team's research have been focusing on over the last two years. So, so first of all, I show you a semantic embedding model. So, in, so the whole point is that when you have natural language or any other symbolic information, like business data, like, like email data, like, uh, you know, uh, whatever data you're talking about, they are not normally connected to each other in terms of their numerical comparisons, right? So for example, you get a racing car and, you know, Formula One, you know, a computer has no idea they are similar to each other, right? Uh, and then you might have something like, um, you know, it's, it's like you know, racing to me, right? And that's a concept. 
and that has something in common, racing and racing car. But they are not just as close to racing car as Formula One, right? So if you are just looking at the symbolic representation, you lose all this similarity uh, concept. And now, one of the main innovation about the uh, deep learning uh, is that it creates this concept called the symbol embedding, simply by embed symbolic information into a neural, uh, neural, uh, neural vector. And later on, I'll talk about neural uh, tensor. It's a much more advanced version than this. So if you do the learning right, knowing that certain concepts are with each other from your sample, it's called the supervised learning, you actually can train the model. But in order to train the model, it has to have several uh, layers represented. Otherwise, your know, things will never work out. And there's a very obvious reason, because the similarity has to be propagated in a way that you know, it's sufficient enough to be projected into the same uh, semantic space. Um, so if you actually train the network right, actually I have a five slide to show how to train, which I'm going to skip. So this is the, after the training. You can see that Formula One and uh, racing car become mapped into the uh, three hundred dimension space with the same, you know, more or less the same direction. Whereas uh, racing to me, which even, even if it shares the same word here, it will be far apart from each other because semantically they are not related as much as, much as Formula One. So actually, uh, so this kind of model uh, was done actually about four or five years ago, four years ago, uh, uh, and actually has been now, I can tell you that it has been used in Bing search. Uh, if you read uh, 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 rank brain uh, kind of uh, you know, news, whatever, in Google, they use uh, some algorithm very similar to this, and Baidu's, actually at one, at one time I actually read Baidu's uh, a search diagram about semantic search, the diagram looks just like this, uh, with a little bit, you know, imp uh, sort of sophistication there. So now you can see that this is, uh, can be used for, uh, for web search because the, you can think about these uh, are different documents, and this is maybe query. Right? So you want to match query with semantic most relevant uh, documents, and then you can do comparison, and you can generalize this concept to go beyond the web search to do uh, uh, information retrieval to be something more interesting. So here, actually, we have done a, lot of in, a whole bunch of information. So the con general concept is you have the source information, you have target information. If the source information is the query and target in information is uh, documents, you get web search or you get you know, information retrieval. And if inf uh, input information is, um, you know, information is, uh, you know, so for this kind of question answering, if input information is pattern, uh, in terms of question, and the output is the answer, you can do the same kind of uh, comparison and do the same kind of learning. And the learning is not as simple as cross entropy or mean square error. It actually is, actually, the objective function is a very actually interesting. I mean, since we actually work on speech for years, we actually, essentially, the mutual information is the criterion for us to train that. And when, when you use the maximum mutual information to train, all this semantic information will come together. And that's the concept very much familiar to our, our community here. So I'm going to, well, so actually, so for each of this, it will be one lecture here. So I'm just, uh, for the sake of this, I'm just going to take about five minutes to talk about this specific application where the source, rather than being query, the source can be the image and the target can be image uh, text caption. I'm going to show you this system that Microsoft developed to show you how this type of semantic model can be used in multi-modality kind of processing that includes mapping from image to natural language. And you could actually think about mapping uh, from image to speech as well. Um, so, I'm, I'm, so, the, so the system goes as follows. And we actually have this paper uh, with a whole bunch of, a bunch of my colleagues, and many, many of them are here uh, in, in CVPR. And the whole point is that you get an image here, and then the goal is that you want that to speak up to you, or maybe to show the uh, natural language. Um, so for this uh, you know, image, um, um, the computer will speed up saying that that's a stop sign at an intersection on a city uh, street. And that's a huge amount of in, uh, application in this. And in, so different uh, company or university have different ways of attacking that problem. It turns out that it's just about uh, a CVPR. All of a sudden, about five, six paper, papers are you know, in this, the same category. And New York Times has this uh, you know, very nice so description about this uh, at that time. That was a while ago. So the first stage is to do a computer vision system to extract the features 
but that feature has to be in the same semantic space as in natural language. Otherwise, there's no way to connect uh, a text with the image. Right? But that, luckily, uh, we have this image net system to make that to be extremely uh, powerful. So, so if you actually move your, um, your window over the image, you actually, you know, just simply just using the, uh, the stupid uh, this image net system, you can get a whole bunch of words. But those words, are, you know, have no way of putting up in the sentence, right? And also natural sentence has a lot of, you know, nuanced words, like uh, adjectives, like, you know, all these articles, etc. And, you know, image system won't be able to do it. So the way we approach the problem is that we actually, just like speech recognition, think about this image to be speech waveform. And then we will speed up a whole bunch of words or phonemes, whatever. And then you need to rely on either dictionary to piece uh, phonemes together or use the language model to piece together uh, the, uh, the sentence. And uh, we, uh, yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're at that time, about two years ago, we are very conservative. We just use the kind of concatenated modular approach to solve the problem. Um, and then once um, the language model produced a whole bunch of candidates, then we use the semantic model to rank them. We choose the best one. And without that uh, your semantic model to the match, the result is horrible. So once we use that, we actually, uh, uh, this is a result to show you. So, um, so this is the uh, picture. I'm doing Turing test now. So A or B, one of them is from machine. The other one is from human. Which one is human? Which is machine? So who says A is machine? The remaining? Yeah, so that's minority, right? But anyway, yeah, so you're right. So only three of you said that it, that's correct. <laughs> but anyway, so the point is that it's very hard to, uh, for human to judge, you know, which one is which, right? So we actually ran this. So this machine, that's human. So we actually run this uh, uh, challenge uh, at CVPR, nothing, uh, just uh, about seven months, seven or eight months ago. So we actually collected, you know, tons of examples like the one I show you. And then we actually invited about, I think about 15 uh, group participated in, uh, in this challenge. Um, and Microsoft, we have two different versions. Uh, Toronto has a version, Berkeley, you know, the whole list. Uh, now, the M2 is the Turing test I just did for you. So this number shows the percentage of the, um, the samples in the test set where either the human and machine could not tell the difference between the two, or human uh, or the you know, machine is doing better than human. Right? So that's the test. It's about 30%. So we are, and even, uh, but he, even you have human, it's not 100%, because different human will have things differently. Right? So when, when we ask a human to do Turing tests, he only gave us uh, uh, 67%. And the computer, our system, and Google system are very similar to each other. It got about uh, 32%, right? So this kind of, for this kind of task, it's about, well, about half towards uh, Turing test. So that's the uh, example of application of semantic model in multi-modality sort of space. So I'm going to spend uh, more time now telling you about this uh, uh, Google Now and uh, with deep reinforced learning for those of you who have not read much. Actually, uh, a lot of people actually ask me, in, including some many media uh, when I visited here, uh, asking me to, uh, to describe what this, what the implication is for AI. So I'm, I have done a lot of study on this. Actually, I watched all five games from the beginning to the end. So now, before uh, I talk about, uh, I talk about uh, AlphaGo, I first of all want to show you one earlier step. Uh, that was the, what's called Atari game. Uh, so this is paper again, uh, actually done uh, beautifully by uh, DeepMind researchers. And by the way, so this person is the one who led this uh, uh, sort of AlphaGo. Um, so the point of this paper is that I mean, I mean, if you ignore all the technical details, the punchline of the whole paper is that uh, reinforced learning has never been worked out well in the past, just like a neural net has never worked out until deep learning concept injected, get injected into the system. And the same thing happened. So reinforced learning actually from that point on can be considered to be from not working in the past into working. 
And the reason why it does change is because the deep learning embedded into the system. So I would like to show you uh, uh, this diagram from that paper. Um, so the input for the game, for those of you who don't play game, don't worry about, okay? You're, you're not going to miss, uh, miss this. And the decision making part is how do you control the, um, how do you control the joystick so that you can shoot, you know, something down, right? Um, and what happens is that this is just a standard deep neural network. Nothing special about this, except how do you get the label to do the training, okay? Um, now the label um, actually is created through what's a Q learning. And the huge amount of input space sort of created by the image. This is the perception or the image from the game console goes into computer system. This the state space is huge because it's not just the number of pixels, but all the possible combinations of pixels. It's just infinite almost. And the whole point of this uh, DQ and deep Q network is that you can actually map this space as actually not the whole space, but each instan instantiation of the space as the image into a neural network. And you can imagine that how complicated that mapping is, right? That's why you need to have very deep, uh, uh, many, many numbers. Uh, I think these are uh, three or four, four layers. I think that could be. And then once you map over here, and then using reinforced learning, uh, it's called a credit uh, sort of uh, assignment kind of propagation uh, method, you know, cue learning method, to create kind of pseudo level label to train them, and also doing sort of uh, some uh, what's called exploration, which I don't have time to go over here. And they actually show the result that can beat human players. They actually, actually half of the games, they are much better than human, and the other half are slightly lower than human. And that's actually, it's very impressive. So the, uh, I think the second day after this paper was out, so we took a look at this, we immediately realized that this concept can be used for in many practical applications. So I'm gonna show you uh, the concept of reinforced learning here. And the concept of reinforcement is very different than the standard learning that we know about in terms of supervised learning. Well, in supervised learning, like image recognition, you have image, you have to have a label. And for speech, you have to write the whole sentence out. Well, you cannot say that, well, you don't know until you, know, you get you know, information uh, coming back. Whereas in the game, you don't know. Right? You don't know that action co corresponds to the best thing to have. Because you might actually lose, you might win. Right? You, you, so you need to some very smart way of determining how to guide your system here. So this is a very nice demo, actually also created by, uh, by, uh, by DeepMind associated with that paper. So uh, read it carefully, look at it. Ah, sorry, you can see, can you see that? Okay, you cannot see that, that's too bad. Okay, you can see that, I mean, so the, the action is to move where to, where, where to put over here, and the goal is to shoot as many uh, little pieces down as possible, right? And that's the short term. So, so if you really don't do, it's just like a supervised learning for AlphaGo, if you don't do reinforced learning, you actually just locally optimize whatever you can. You probably sh are happy if you shoot two down, and that's it, right? Every time you shoot the two, every time two, two or three at the end, you maybe got whatever score it is. And that's what the, you know, what's called the supervised learning is going to give you. Now, if you, use, if you were to use the reinforced learning, it's amazing, look at this. It actually automatically discovers that you actually can create a hole to go up there to kill everything down. Although in the beginning, maybe every time you shoot there, you know, you may just get one, you just get one, you get one. It's not as big as over here when you shoot, you get two, three, four, right? So in the beginning, you're not doing as well as this. But if you actually be patient and then you design the algorithm, then can tolerate some early loss. It's just like business negotiation, right? You actually sometimes give discount to your partner. You don't you lose money, right? But after a while, you open up the market, and then you get big bad propagation, you know, uh, credit assignment, you know. Once you learn all this, you can do tons of uh, application. Um, so here, I would just uh, let show that for the short term, uh, it's, it's like uh, uh, supervised learning in this particular scenario. You know, you, you maximize immediate reward, you're happy, you know, da, da, da. Now for the long term, you can do so many other things, you can optimize the long term uh, information. And obviously this one, so actually most of my people in my team actually are working on this problem uh, over the last, you know, uh, one and a half years. 
And also another important uh, application is spoken dialogue system and AI chat. How does the system, the agent, reply to you? And that's not a short-term thing. Right? Although if you do the short-term thing, you get something like xiao eyes uh, for those of you in China. And uh, I'm just this morning, I revised my slides because I just got news that this Xiao Ai's English version called 19-year-old American girl called Tay is a lie. Uh, it just started this morning. So when I say today, this is an example in the article, news article, uh, would you like to kill baby Hitler? He said, of course. And this is all the agent, right? It's a bot. Uh, and then with what app weapon? Totally lost here. It's all automatic. Uh, you can see that, you know, if, if it's the local, you can still get something but not as exciting as if you were to use reinforced learning. Anyway, so now talking about Go, so let me go back here. So now in terms of Go, actually the same, this is the same kind of concept for reinforced learning. Uh, for those of you who really want to know uh, about what's going on, this is a very good paper. Yeah, they wrote a very nice paper here. So the deep learning um, pipeline in AlphaGo goes as follows. First of all, this is a very uh, interesting uh, framework. So they use the human experience like, uh, you know, human, um, this is a, a deposited database. There's a database that contains about 16,000, uh, you know, really good uh, player history information. And they train uh, something called a, a supervised learning policy network. And then going through, you know, this optimization technique. Um, and the key is that now 16,000 is very, very little right, to train the system that actually can predict the best, uh, you know, the best placement for your stone. So what they did is that they used the reinforcement learning to train the policy network through sales playing. So once you train the system with a reasonably good performance, you can play against each other and then using some very nice reinforcement learning framework to sort of, because sales play also has the concept of winning, right? Sales play, you know, you just keep going and then, and then you back propagate you know, through, you know, temporal uh, assignment, uh, corrective assignment for the right, the correct winning one. So the information is a very, very weak because Go typically is very long compared with many other games like chess is much shorter. And they, I think they used about two, um, 20 million up to 20 to 30 million uh, of this uh, self play position. And I think the, uh, the, num uh, the, 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 the information I read is that in terms of the computer, it's about 2,000 CPUs and about 300 GPUs. Huge amount of research put, you know, to process all the data. And they also have to do some very nice uh, search in order to get the result out. So, um, but the whole point is that this entire system is centered on this two deep neural network. One predicts the policy, or it's called the policy network, it predicts the probability of the possible actions according to something you see here. I mean, so and that serves the role of limiting the choice of how many choice you want to go. I mean, for each uh, play, it's about 361. And only a few of them are promising. So you don't want to exhaust, you know, to, to go into some, you know, unpromising land. But that's not good enough because you also have depth on how many rounds you are playing. And that's determined by value network. That's a one single value. It's done by regression. And the target over here is based upon also by our, our reinforcement learning method. Uh, so here I did some summary. Yeah, I don't have time to go through here. Actually, there are four uh, neural network, and detailed analysis actually shows that every one of them is very important. Um, so I don't have time to go through here. And the final part here is, um, is what's called the Monte Carlo tree search which is very similar to, I mean, for those of you who are in speech recognition in 80s, 90s, you remember we have this uh, A-star search uh, many years ago. Um, uh, so this is similar, uh, it's problem-specific search algorithm. You think about it as a decoder. Um, and, and for that reason, uh, AlphaGo is not general AGI, uh, it's not uh, general AI, it's still specific AI, okay? So that's to make it clear. So think about this multi color search as a component that's a highly efficient um, uh, decoder, and the concept is very similar to speech recognition. Um, and the A star search, actually, uh, you know, you, you, for those of you who, uh, who are doing speech recognition many years ago, remember there's a component called a fast match using lexical access. Right? Now they're all gone, right? because the reason why they're all gone is because speech is a relatively simple signal. You can get rid of all this graph, you know, structure, so it's just do directly 
to do dynamic programming being with the right thing, it solves most of the problems. That's what's speech recognition system now. Um, so we kind of forgot about all this, you know, uh, you know, uh, sort of structured search. Whereas in Go, this is a necessary component. Now, the major, the key innovation of this uh, algorithm in this system is that um, the score that is required to guide the search are all computed by deep neural network. And the way to determine how breadth, how wide it is, is done by, uh, is created, is sort of is guided by the output of policy network and then the way to control how deep you are going to go for the game. Uh, otherwise, you, you don't want to go to the 100 or something, right? And that's, that's crazy. It's done by value network. It's just an ingenious uh, way of constraining the search space using deep neural network, two types of neural network in order to achieve the. So I'm not going to go through all these detailed uh, uh, equations just to show you that the score, actually Q function, is like, you know, like speech recognition score by which you decide where to expand. Exactly the same thing, but that's called Q function in this game. If they are done by different components. Some components are coming from exploration, uh, which I don't have time to do. Some of them are done by, you know, by the rigorous search. Anyway, so those are, are very well done. So the punchline here is that the, uh, the neural, deep neural network plays an extremely important role for our reinforced learning. And the reason why Facebook actually got really terrible results is that they only did supervised learning. That, uh, they didn't get what they said. They didn't have time to do uh, reinforced learning. That's why. I mean, it's just, it's just not comparable. OK, so I'm going to spend uh, the remaining uh, 20, OK, only 10 minutes or so, or maybe less, to talk about other components of machine cognition and memory attention. Uh, as a matter of sense, I need to have some time for Q&A. Let me uh, quickly go through. So this is how you all know it here. <laughs> OK, so the point, yeah, this is an important point. So the point is that, I mean, for neural machine translation, people typically use something called the thought vector, right? So neural net give you the thought vector and you thought to do and, and this is just a terrible idea. Uh, so this is well said by Professor uh, Ray Mooney. He actually was spending a sabbatical with us um, uh, last year. When he, the first time he heard this, he actually said, you can cram the meaning of a whole sum sentence into a single da -da 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 vector. And it turned out to be right. And actually, af after he made this comment, we actually, uh, we actually saw that this attention model came around. That is designed exactly to avoid that problem. So, uh, yeah, so if I got time, uh, I, and then the result, uh, so this for WMT result, for English, for German, it's slightly better the best baseline. This is the punchline for this slide. Uh, so there are also Stanford guys are doing some more advanced version of attention with the local as well as global attention, and they got a substantially better result for this year's competition. So we see that uh, the deep learning now is exceeding the state of the art now already, just fairly firm result in uh, machine translation uh, field, but not nearly as much as in image and speech. So the same thing can be used for, the same attention mechanism can be used for image captioning, as well as for image, kept, uh, you know, some question answering. So finally, uh, so let me skip this. And then I will go to the final a few minutes of presentation, talking about how to do structured representation uh, with a concept called the uh, tensor product representation. And there's a book over here. So that led me to the last topic, very quick topic about three hot areas of deep learning and AI research. And the first one is how to do structured embedding so that not only do you sort of embed the sentence or attention, but also you can embed the entire structure, either past tree, semantic tree, and because these are necessary when you want to design advanced reasoning system. And we are pushing some specific, uh, you know, uh, approach where we see some, you know, uh, some interesting, uh, uh, you know, uh, future. So let's go one by one. So this is a, a diagram to show you how this tensor uh, sort of uh, product um, representation can actually help to do this semantic uh, processing. So for example, you have the structure over here to go from here to here, and that's a very traditional AI. You go from uh, you know, a, a past tree, and then you want to guess what the semantic meaning is, the logic of L, uh, so L, 
LF stands for logical form. And A is the agent, pa, uh, P is uh, patient. And this is all the AI terminology. This is crazy. If you do that, what's going to happen is that you have to compile just all the world knowledge in order to get it. That's actually one of the earlier um, sort of effort in AI about 20 years ago called the site. They compile just tons of knowledge to do this. And the, uh, all these projects fail until we don't know when, okay? Hopefully not very, uh, very far from now. So and t and the reason why it's difficult to do that is because it's very hard to, in to actually inject learning into the system. People had to do all the rules and they had exception and using logic uh, inference to do it. It's different style, very, very different style of the learning in human logical or cognitive system as well as in machine learning capability. So machine learning scalability that we have enjoyed so far in terms of deep uh, learning, deep neural network, have not, cannot be applied in the sim purely symbolic system. I show you some of these incidents already in terms of uh, semantic embedding. And one way of overcoming that difficulty is that, is to project this, uh, any structure into a tensor representation, which can be considered to be, you know, low, you know, low high dimensional vector if you want. You can do that. And this is illustrated in here. And then, uh, and then do whatever learning matrix, a neural network, deep neural net, and then you give the output. So the nice thing about this isomorphism mapping from here to here using this tensor product representation is that it actually allows you to recover the structure uniquely. So once you do the learning, you project something over here, then you do sort of unbinding operation. You recover the meaning completely. So all the computation learning is done in the neural domain. And after you do sort of binding and unbinding, it can project all the structure into the learning system and project everything out. Then you can interpret them, you can do reasoning, all the things can be done over here. And that's one direction we are looking, uh, we are looking at. So the second direction is to look at the integration of what's called the neural network and uh, generative model. So this is the slides actually I, I, actually I show a few times. Uh, most of the people probably don't get it for those of you in the speech. So I was very lucky to get the opportunity to attend one of the tutorials called particle filtering about nonlinear dynamic system. They show all the mathematical property for this. And look at, looking at the equation, I don't know whether the lecture here, Tom here, I mean, we have just wonderful discussion one, uh, afterwards. Actually, it turns out that mathematical equation is all identical. There's no difference whatsoever. The only difference, well, I think there is a difference, right? otherwise. So, the form of mathematical equation in terms of dynamic system is just like a neural network, recurs, a recurrent neural network. Now the main difference is that you actually flip in input output. You have the information flow in the opposite direction. And that really creates huge difference in terms of algorithm, in terms of ability to incorporate you know, all this. So we can see very soon, hopefully, that many of the learning algorithms that we are doing by propagation over here and the nonlinear dynamic system in terms of propagating uncertainty of particle filtering may actually have some harmony to each other. But anyway, so that's why. And the reason why you want to do that, right? the reason why we want to do that is because this generative model and uh, the human model as a neural, they have, they have very, very different characteristics. Right? It's just not just, if you look at mathematical equation, you can see the difference. But if you look at how those quantities are represented in the equation, you see all these differences. So actually, I recently wrote a chapter uh, actually uh, with, with a good friend um, actually at Google Brain together to actually summarize um, these pros and cons of different style of the model in terms of the way to do, to incorporate knowledge, the way to do scalability, the way to do representation, and also how interpretable the result is. And this Bayesian method has much better way of interpreting the result than neural network. And that's something, and people are still working on that one. Right? But this one problem is already you know, solved because we know the way you represent your model is you want to make that interpretable. The way you construct the model is to have everything interpretable. Um, and the most important part that relates to the next, the final challenge is what's called the uh, unsupervised learning, which is very, very hard. It's even more difficult than, uh, than, than reinforced learning. So I have one slide here just to show you a little bit of, um, of the flavor of some of the thinking that we have. Um, so it has been uh, recently been a very hot topic in deep learning. 
So if you actually watch the video for, uh, for this three hour, two and a half hours of tutorial in NIPS, uh, at the end, all the questions come up is re related to, to answerable learning. And the, um, and the uh, lecturer keeps saying that nobody has an uh, idea of how to do that right. And I hope this is the right way of doing that. So I personally believe that talking about unsupervised learning in the abstract form has no meaning whatsoever. We really have to ground unsupervised learning into some concrete task like prediction. So coming down to you know, speech recognition, image captioning task, for example, you get X, you get a Y, right? Your label is Y, you know, uh, your acoustic is X. Now you say, don't worry about it. You, know, you have you know, 3,000 hours of uh, you know, speech label, but you have three millions of uh, you know, audio which are on the label, right? How are you able to take advantage of those data that don't have the acoustic uh, to improve your system? And because those, uh, you know, uh, so this is the related issue about how this pair, uh, you know, the language model and acoustic can turn together. You just cannot do them all, you know, label all together. And I think for, yeah, this is one example. Now for image captioning, it is the same challenge. Um, so my personal belief is that, I mean, this is the belief that I share with many of people in my, in my team, that we need to explore the knowledge. And the knowledge can be divided into two, four different sources. One is the prior structure of the label and also the structured information about the input. And as a matter of conventional, if you read the literature, everything about the uh, unsupervised learning is focusing on this only. And that's not enough. You also have to model, exploit the relationship between input and output. And that's what generation model tell you. That's one direction. You also have to exploit information from the other direction. You have all these four uh, pieces you've been together, I think. Uh, there is a chance to solve unsupervised learning. This is my final slide. So in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. So I think there's a lot, this is a quote from very famous uh, computer scientists. And that's it, thank you very much. Thank you, Lee, uh, for very comprehensive and informative uh, plenary, plenary talk. Uh, we have already over one, uh, overrun, but I'm sure uh, Lee would be happy to stay behind for a few more minutes to take up any questions. But for those who have uh, uh, other engagements, please uh, do uh, go to uh, wherever meetings you have registered. And for those who actually have registered for the ethics for authors and volunteers sections, um, the venue has been moved to the Yan Chi Ho River on the fifth floor. So uh, please find the right place, okay? Uh, are there any questions from the floor? Uh, one over there. Can somebody hand over a microphone to him? Uh, I have a, uh, first of all, thank you. Thanks for the uh, extensive overview. I have a question uh, specific to the speech recognition or the LSTM plus CDC. And I, it appears that you have uh, a high hope for these uh, non HMM based uh, uh, techniques like CDC. But uh, uh, like, uh, for me, I have yet to, to see any papers from, uh, coming from Microsoft uh, about uh, uh, in, in that direction. That's my first question. So do you have comments on that? Yes. And okay. I yeah, I think we have a lot of engineers, uh, researchers over here in this. Uh, I think it's better for you to ask them. Yeah, actually, I have been away from speech for the last one and a half years. Okay. So, so my yeah, thank you. The uh, extended, extended question is that, uh, uh, do you think it is, is, it is time now that uh, we move away from a German-based system for speech recognition? So, say, I, I think here, can you just summarize your question? So, we have been using HMM based uh, uh, techniques for speech recognition for over, you know, since the beginning of speech, speech recognition. But do you think it is time uh, that. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, okay, I get it. Out. Yeah, of course. I mean, if CT takes off, verify by everything, you actually don't need to have that hidden Markov model anymore. But eventually, I mean, there's a similarity there anyway, right? So, I think uh, CDC with the end-to-end -end learning probably will be the best way to pursue. And in that case, you can say that HMA can be gone. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah, there's one over there. Yeah, can somebody pass the microphone over there? Yeah. Uh, pl uh, please raise your hand. Who would like to raise a question? Yes, please. 
Thank you, Professor, for the nice talk. Yeah. Uh, my question is with respect to the uh, perception uh, and the mechanism in the brain. It is said in the neuroscience that if one region of the brain fails, the other region of the brain takes it over for a certain extent. How this adaptive mechanism is incorporated in the deep learning mechanism? Yeah, I think uh, the uh, echo is very strong. I, I don't quite get Maybe just ask short questions so I may be able to catch. My question is how in DNA network, the adaptive mechanism of human brain, in particular, if one region of the brain fails, other region of the brain takes it its functions. So how this auto-associativeness is, is incorporated or implemented in DNN? Or there is some relationship between this mechanism in brain with respect to the mechanism or architecture of DNN? Oh, yeah. Yeah, actually, if I, uh, are you talking about the brain? Yes. DNA in brain versus DNA over here? Yes. Yeah, um, so I personally believe that um, um, there are a lot of mechanism in human brain system that have not been exploited in current technology. But on the other hand, there are some biological limitations of the system that we should not model directly for technology's sake. And which one is which? I have some ideas. But I, this is a too, long, too long a topic <laughs> to, to describe over here. So there are a few extremely, extremely important uh, aspects of the uh, human cognitive system, which are, one of them is the size, right? The complexity is not there. And many of those are very important. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, thank we you. can take uh, one last question. That, yeah, the, the native at the back, yeah. Thanks for sharing. My question is about uh, for AlphaGo bits, the, they said, though, uh, so what do you think to be the implication for um, scientist communities like, uh, like IEE? Thank you. Oh, yeah, right. Thank you very much. This is a very general question here. So I personally have this uh, feeling that, uh, as I said earlier on, to me, the direct algorithm from you know, self-play, which is major innovation, of AlphaGo may not apply to any of the um, tasks that we are doing now. However, it actually strengthens everybody's belief that deep neural network is an extremely powerful way of representing, representing the information. And if you do reinforcement learning right, which of course will differ from task to task, then you actually will get a very good signal to train deep neural network. And when you combine them together, you can do you know, miracle things. And that's the kind of implication that I see that AlphaGo provides to our community. So just like yesterday, I was actually uh, talking with a few people doing communication there, uh, including uh, actually uh, during one presentation in my session, actually learning uh, theory session, as well as in the dinner time. Many of uh, people in this conference are doing communication signal processing. And the problem that what I hear are very, very similar to this reinforcement learning, like flow, how do you direct the packet in the, neural, uh, in the uh, internet or in the wireless network? And how do you make sure that whatever you deliver the package, you eventually can get there with a minimum delay? And that's, that to me, when I hear that problem, that's, that really is the reinforcement learning problem. <laughs> So I think, and I, was t I told them, have you ever get a chance to see this kind of uh, range of learning to see whether you can apply? They said, no, 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 the space, the space is just too large. We can never use this rigorous uh, sort of uh, dynamic program to solve the problem. I said, well, if you read this paper, you know that the large space shouldn't scare us because the neural net is there to help you to do this. And, then, and, and if you actually build a neural network you know, powerful enough and get the right supervision signal through you know, part of this reinforced learning, you know, tricks. Uh, I think a lot of things can be solved. Maybe, you know, next year from, uh, you know, next year or the following years, so you might see communication signal project may benefit the kind of algorithm that we have seen here. Thank you. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, we have to stop here. Uh, please join me to thank Dr. Dan for a very uh, 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 wonderful talk. And uh, on behalf of the OC, I would like to present him a souvenir as a token of appreciation. Thank you.